Man, what's up with home prices? According to Redfin's latest update published just a few days ago, we now set a record for the median sales price for houses in the United States, now at $383,000. And many people are really upset and frustrated that home prices have not completely crashed and burned. And they're looking for anyone to blame they can get their hands on. They're looking to blame the Federal Reserve. They're looking to blame Democrats. Some are blaming Republicans. Many are blaming the National Association of Realtors. Some folks are blaming evil, diabolical realtors like me. Many are blaming large investors. A lot of people are also blaming small investors, mom and pop investors like me. Some people are blaming Airbnb. Some are blaming baby boomers. Some are blaming millennials. They're blaming the guy upstairs, the guy next door, the guy down there, or the guy over here. They're blaming anyone they can get their hands on except themselves. But sitting around and blaming people for high home prices doesn't really get you anywhere if you're actually serious about purchasing a house or even an investment property. And so today we're looking at exactly why prices are so high. The information is pretty shocking. And then maybe we can determine how home prices can actually come down or what will make them come down. But before we get started, please do me a favor, hit the like button if you get any value out of the video and consider subscribing to my channel. Whatever you do though, comment below. I wanna know what's happening in your neck of the woods. To kick things off, we're gonna watch a short clip from Fox News that has an interview with a guy named Lance Lambert from Resi Club Analytics, and he goes into the simple facts of what we're looking at today. So taking into account mortgage rates, incomes, and house prices, affordability right now is strained at the worst levels in about four decades. And so when you have that and a lot of home buyers can't get in and a lot of homeowners can't sell and buy something else because they can't afford those new monthly payments, what you see is a lot of political scapegoating. And so they're going after, you know, in some municipalities, uh, short-term rentals, Airbnbs, uh, talking about the institutional side of the market, and then also scapegoating real estate agents. NAR is going after, or DOJ is going after NAR, and you know they act like uh, lowering commissions would improve housing affordability. You know, going after soccer moms making sixty thousand a year because uh, that's the only job that works around their kids' schedule. Going after them. But at the end of the day, if you look out at a lot of the countries that have lower commissions, they don't have better housing affordability. These European countries actually have worse housing affordability. And uh, so it's a lot of scapegoating. And really the only thing that's going to improve housing affordability is more supply. You know, it's things that are boring, more ADUs, uh, upzoning, tax policy that works for new construction, not against new construction, lower fees on home building, all the boring stuff that would long-term increase supply, that's what would improve housing affordability. All right, so what did you think of that video? What do you think about what Lance had to say? A lot of scapegoating going on, right? Like, hey, let's blame anybody we can get our hands on, but let's just not look at the facts. And sometimes the facts are hard to look at and hard to digest, but it's important to be factual instead of just hopes, wants, and wishes. So what you can see here is that according to Redfin, prices are up again. They're up 5.2% year over year, and now at a record high of $383,000. It doesn't look like the price growth is slowing down. Something I've heard from a lot of folks on YouTube is that the median sales price data has been manipulated by the fact that luxury homes are outselling affordable homes. However, none of these folks dive into the next layer of data that's super important, and that's active inventory. So I'm in Ohio, I'm a realtor in central Ohio, so I pulled this data from my local MLS, but this demonstrates what I'm talking about. So first off, let's look at the solds. So in central Ohio in 2024, for houses under $300,000, we sold 1,077 homes year to date. Now let's look at homes over 300 grand. We sold 1,203 homes. Definitely more expensive homes are selling than affordable homes. In Columbus, the median's around 300, 320 or so. So that's why I picked $300,000. And look at the difference. For affordable homes, down 15% year over year in sales. Luxury homes or homes priced over the median, up 2%. Definitely a difference. But let's not stop there. Let's look at the active inventory. Because my guess is a lot of the folks on YouTube don't want you to know about that. 
So now we're looking at active listings, homes available to purchase. In 2024, this is just for March data in Central Ohio, under $300,000, we had 1,280 homes for sale. Now look at over $300,000. We have 1,987 homes for sale over 300 grand. Now let's look at the difference between 2024 and 2023. You can see that under $300,000, we're only up 4% year over year as far as active inventory. Homes over 300 grand, we're up 26% with active inventory. Overall, up 16% with active listings. So it's true, we are selling more expensive homes than affordable homes. But guess why? Why is that? Because we have less available affordable homes to choose from. That's why. So it's an inventory situation. It's not like there's a ton of affordable inventory just sitting around and people are walking past it. Wrong. There is a huge lack of supply for affordable inventory. I'm guessing it's like that in your area. Comment below. I'd love to know and be truthful. I mean, are the price cuts and the inventory you're seeing for affordable homes that about anybody can afford? I doubt it. It's probably for more expensive homes. But something else you have to think about is what happens when affordable homes that are priced right in great neighborhoods do hit the market. There's actual bidding war still in many areas. That's what's happening. And I can tell you from personal experience because just over the last week, I've worked with several buyers who are looking for their first house and they continually run into bidding wars. We're running into escalation clauses, running into waiving contingencies like inspections or appraisals. People are willing to pay over asking 10, 20, $30,000 over asking for affordable homes because there's nothing to choose from. So that's driving up the price of homes. It's not that people are walking past affordable homes to the more expensive houses. Wrong. It's because people can't find affordable homes to actually purchase. All right. Now it's time to look at another data set and that's about foreclosures. So in a lot of situations in a healthy housing market, historically, there are foreclosures that occur every single month every single year. And that adds to the supply of affordable home inventory. So let's look at 2010 for a second. Back in quarter two of 2010, we had nearly 300,000 completed foreclosures. This charts from Adam Data, and it represents completed foreclosure sales. So nearly 300,000 sales from foreclosures. And that, my friends, is a good amount of affordable inventory. But now flash forward to 2024, we have a huge lack of foreclosures. So the idea that there's going to be a foreclosure wave and you know, you're going to be able to get just, you know, houses for pennies on the dollar like people did back in 2012, that may happen in the future, but right now none of the signs are there. And remember, we're living in reality. You can live in fantasy worlds if you want, but if you want to be successful in real estate, I think you should live in reality. So now we're going to look at some mortgage data because this will show us why there are hardly any foreclosures and it'll help explain why affordable inventory is low and prices continue to climb. So check this out. This is the percentage of owner occupied units without a mortgage. People who have zero mortgage payments and zero debt on their primary residence. And this is according to the US Census Bureau. This article I'm sharing though in this data set it was actually curated from uh, Resi Club Analytics and Lance Lambert. By the way, if you haven't checked out Resi Club, you definitely should. The link's in my description below. Check this out. Back in 2010, 32% of all homeowners did not have a mortgage on their property. And it climbed. It kept climbing. And now it's 38.5% in 2022. That's the latest data that the U.S. Census Bureau has. But clearly, people own their home outright more so than any other time. Now look at this. Since 2022, all cash home buying as a percentage of home sales has increased as many of these mortgage-free homeowners carried over equity to avoid taking on these higher rates. In quarter one, 2022, 25.8% of all transactions or home sales were all cash. In quarter four of 2023, 33.5% of all homes purchases were made in all cash. All right. So now we know about foreclosures and why they're not hitting the street and why that affordable inventory isn't making to the street and maybe some of why prices continue to go up. 
Because if you do not have a mortgage on a property, you can't get foreclosed on. I mean, you can for taxes, but you're not going to for a mortgage because there isn't one. And so the more people that pay cash for their properties or the more people that pay off their mortgages, obviously less for foreclosures. And those people who have no mortgage on their property, and now they're looking at a 7% rate to move up into the house, they're locked in. They're locked into their home. They don't want to buy that more expensive house. And so their current affordable house never hits the market for you to purchase. So now that we've talked about the lock-in effect briefly, let's really dial in the data on the lock-in effect. So this map is awesome. It shows the number of sales lost because of the lock-in effect. And remember, the lock-in effect is simply the effect of people not wanting to give up their low interest rates right now or their low house price in order to move up into a more expensive home. And that keeps that affordable inventory off the market. But if you look at this, this shows state by state how many sales were lost between quarter two of 2022 and quarter four of 2023. And it's just staggering. So like in Ohio, where I am, 33,000 less sales, which means 33,000 less active listings. And a lot of these are affordable homes. Look at Texas, 125 thousand less sales because of the lock-in effect. 182,000 in California. I mean, there's not a state in the United States that did not lose sales and inventory because of the lock-in effect. Look at Florida, 90,000 less. Makes a big difference. All right, now we're going to look at a second set of data. This is also from Resi Club Analytics. The last, the map I just showed was from Resi Club. This one is as well. So this chart not only shows the number of homes and sales lost because of the lock-in effect, it actually shows the effective mortgage rate, meaning what do people typically have in that market for a mortgage rate? And then it compares it to the current market rate of mortgages, which in this example, they're using 7.2%. So let's start here and we, you'll see what I mean. San Jose, California, effective mortgage rate, 3.5%. You look at all the mortgages in the area, you blend them together, you get 3.5%. But the mortgage rate now in the market is 7.2%. Big difference. That's a difference of 3.7%. So the lock-in effect, reduced probability of sale, shows the amount the homeowner shows the reduced probability that the homeowner would actually sell their property they currently live in. 92%. In other words, people in San Jose are less likely by 92% right now to sell a property because they're already locked into 3.5%. And it says in San Jose, in quarter two of 2022 and quarter four of 2023, San Jose lost 8,610 units. And the list goes on. I mean, look down at this. You can look down here in San Francisco, 20,000 less. And the probability is 87% less likely. And there's really no area of the country that has came out unscathed. Across the country, the lock-in effect is real. Look at Seattle, 3.7% blended rate, 69% lower probability someone is going to sell their primary residence. And they lost 23,000 housing units. Let's look at who lost the most. Newark, New Jersey. New York, Newark, New Jersey. 53,000 less units were sold because of the lock-in effect. That's a big delta from even the one that's next on the list. Washington, D.C., Arlington, Alexandria, down 39,000 units. Dallas, Fort Worth, down 39,000 units. Houston, down 29,000 units. I mean, the list goes on, right? This is from Resi Club. You can go to their website. This is a paid article, though, I believe. Got to tell you, their paid articles are definitely worth it. Their subscription, in my opinion, is a great value. I think it was like $100 for the entire year. But if you skip a couple Starbucks for the month, you're going to pay for it. Let's check Ohio because I live in Ohio. I'm a realtor in Ohio and an investor in Ohio. So let's look at it. Cincinnati, nasty natty, 4% blended rate, lock in effect, Reduced probability of sale, 49% reduced probability of selling their house. We lost 8,000 units in Cincinnati. Columbus, where I live really close to Columbus, 49% lower probability, just like Cincinnati, lost again 8,000 units. And I can tell you, when we have only 3,500 units for sale at any one time in Columbus, when you lose 8,000 in a couple year or year and a half time period, that's a big difference. Again, I hear a lot of people on YouTube talking about how luxury home sales are tainting the data and manipulating the data of the median sales price. They're usually saying this because they don't like the fact that median sales prices continue to increase. 
But in reality, it's because we have a lack of affordable inventory. And if you have more luxury home or expensive inventory, then yeah, the median is going to go up. But you know what? You tell me in your market, are you seeing affordable inventory sit on the market rotting that is prime location, priced right, and in great shape? Or are you seeing bidding more still on those properties? Because I am. And the data shows that median home prices continue to rise even in affordable areas. And just like Columbus, I'm in an affordable market. I live out in the country, kind of. And the median price continues to explode. We're ready to set a record here as well. I just looked at it a couple of days ago. So now, what do we do about this? What can you do as a home buyer? Well, if you go back to the news clip from Fox News, Lance Lambert said it best. It's not really exciting. It's more of the boring stuff. You can't point fingers at really anyone to blame in the marketplace. I mean, if you had an ultra low interest rate, would you give it up just to move up into a more expensive property? Probably not. So why would you blame somebody for doing the same thing? And so more inventory, affordable homes, smaller homes, in my opinion, is what we need. And builders are certainly starting to build smaller homes, but they're not building enough. So we need regulations, zoning permits to change in many cities. ADUs or accessory dwelling units are another way that we can add inventory into urban areas. So there's a lot of cities, especially small towns, where they're very strict with ADUs. They won't let you build a garage in the back of your property and throw up an in-law suite and then rent that out to somebody who can actually have an affordable place to live. And lot splits and zoning regulations prohibit people from splitting their lots and building a property that can be something that people can buy at an affordable price. I'm not sure we can actually blame the zoning rules. There just needs to be some changes to those to make a big difference. But it really comes down to time. I think eventually this will change. I think eventually the market will even out as more people happen to give up their lower rates and give up the affordable inventory. But if you're looking for a property right now, you have two choices. You can either do what most people do, which is MLS, or you can go out and find the property you want if you think outside the box. So how I find properties is with driving for dollars. That's right. I get in a car, I map out the area I want to live in, or in my case, invest in, and then I drive the streets. I actually physically drive them and I write down houses that look like maybe they need some help. Maybe they have deferred maintenance or weeds growing around the outside. And if they're in neighborhoods I like, and it's the type of property I like, I write down the address. Then I come back to the office. I look up their information online and then I mail them a letter just a simple letter that says, hey, I saw the house. I'd like to talk to you about purchasing it. If you're open to selling it, give me a call. If you're not, that's okay. No big deal. And you'd be shocked how many times I purchased properties doing this. You don't need the MLS. Absolutely not. You just need to think differently than what the or normal person is thinking. Now, some of you may laugh at that. Some may scoff and think that's not realistic or I'm not going to do that. That's crazy. And you can continue to look on your phone on Zillow and the MLS or whatever you're using, hoping, wishing, and wanting for prices to come down. But I don't do that. I barely check the MLS most days for properties for myself. I'm out there driving. I'm out there looking for properties and I'm writing them down and then sending them letters. And it's a numbers game. More letters you send, more responses you get. Over the next few weeks, I'm going to launch some videos that describe and take you through the exact steps I use with this driving for dollars method. It's not the only method, but it is a method that works for me and it can probably work for you too. So in conclusion, if you are serious about finding a property to live in or invest in, you can either sit on the sidelines, twirling your thumbs, hoping, wishing, and wanting for some change in the world to come your way and real estate nirvana to rain down on you. Or you can take your success in your own hands, get out there and find a deal. All right, I hope you enjoyed this video. I really appreciate you watching it. Thanks. Have a great day. We'll see you again on the next episode.